is music. Music is a complicated thing. It involves the interplay of many different elements. The imagination of the composer, the skill of the instrument maker, the talent of the performer. Together, they make music using the medium of sound. So first, what is musical sound? Gerard de Wart is a famous player of the carillon. The one he's going to play is high above the streets of a small Dutch town called Austin. Bells are some of the oldest of musical instruments and a familiar sound here, although they're not to everyone's taste. Professional players learn tricks of the trade to limit the impact of those often jarring bell sounds. In the town's famous bell foundry, they construct sand and wax molds into which molten bronze is poured. It's a process which hasn't changed for centuries. Like almost all sounds, what we hear when a bell is struck is a particular combination of pure tones. At the foundry, the tones in each bell are fine-tuned. The tuner uses a vibrating probe, like a tuning fork. This makes the bell produce just one pure tone at a time. Normally, you wouldn't hear it alone. It would be mixed in with the others. Now, he brings out another of the pure tones. By trimming different areas, the tuner finally adjusts each tone component. Working with the foundry recently has been acoustic scientist Adrian Houtsma. At the Eindhoven Technical University, he's recorded and analyzed the pure tone components of bell sounds. First, let's listen to a bell as it was recorded. There are about six main pure tones represented by the high peaks on the screen. It's part of a project to make a new kind of bell. On the right is one of the first, displaying its odd computer-generated profile. With this bell, just one of the pure tone components is different. The man who thought up the idea, foundry director Andre Lair, demonstrates. First of all, I give you the normal, traditional bell, uh, the bell you will hear uh, always uh, in the churches. The new bell has a sweeter, more harmonious sound. To make the new sound, they had to change the large component in the middle. It's known as the minor third. Adrian Houtsma electronically isolated that third component. Here it is, very strong, third component. It doesn't sound much like a bell, it sounds a little bit like a whistle. Now it's displayed again with its companion tones, making the typical bell sound. And now we are going to change this third to a major third and listen to it. Notice how it has moved up, while all the other components have remained the same. Back to the minor third. and a major third. What we're going to do is a live test. Adrian Houtsma electronically synthesized a set of new bells so he could run a comparison test. As I put a tape recorder on, then you hear 45 times after each other two melodies. Let's begin. Train carillon players chose the old bells.
non-musicians preferred the new type. Enough for the foundry to go ahead and cast a complete set of new harmonious bells. Here they are played by Gerard de Wart. Washington's National Cathedral, listening to a 13th century synthesizer, otherwise known as an organ. It's played by Juan Roderer, physicist and musician. Organs are different from other instruments. Once bells or trumpets or violins are built, the pure tone components they produce are fixed. Each has its own limited set of tones, which determines the quality of sound it produces. But organs have hundreds of pipes, each one able to produce a single pure tone. Roderer demonstrates some of them. Played individually, the tones have a pure whistle-like quality, the same as the individual components of the bell sound when isolated. In fact, all musical sound is made up of tones like these. On the organ, they can be individually controlled. The skill of the organist lies in selecting combinations of pure tones, which together make pleasing sound qualities, or timbres as they are called. Let me play a little piece here at the beginning of a choral prelude to illustrate these differences in uh, timbre. First, Roderer uses a combination of five pure tones. Watch or listen to the melody. That's almost trumpet-like. Let me change now. Uh, let me throw away some of these sounds, and you have a different timbre. This one here. Pure tones are the building blocks of all musical sound, a fact that's been known for perhaps a thousand years. I am synthesizing sound 12th, 13th century style. With the electronic age, it was no longer necessary to have hundreds of pipes to synthesize sound. Well, you're looking at uh, one of the very first A-track machines. We used it for switched on Bach, well-tempered synthesizer, right through a uh, good half of Clockwork Orange. This is Wendy Carlos in her Greenwich Village studio. Her synthesized versions of the classics were loved by some, hated by others, but noticed by virtually everyone. Right now, we're listening to the A-track, and we're mixing, sort of playing the role of the conductor, putting together, in this case, a pair of tracks which has all of the string section. It sounds like this. There's a harpsichord track, the two flutes, and there's this nice solo that's split up into two tracks. Let's put them all together. Her early work was with a Moog synthesizer. It's a museum piece now. The way it works is the reverse of a pipe organ. First, it generates these harsh, bright sounds containing many pure tones, like playing all the pipes in an organ at once. We would pack 
pass these bright waves into a filter, which in this case, literally like your tone controls on a hi-fi set, uh, remove portions or boost portions of the sound, we can make it sound very dull, quite pure, or very bright. And you can do this dynamically in time, so sort of percussive or make it open up, make it sit up there. The Moog was revolutionary, but with limited control over the tone components, its sounds were crude. Soon it was overtaken by a second revolution using computers to exactly specify each individual tone component. Unlike the uh, Moog synthesizer, we're not going to be taking away, tearing down bits of a very bright wave. Instead, we're going to put together little overtones, pieces of sounds, uh, characteristic of all sounds, and uh, assemble them additively rather than subtracting parts that we don't want. Using the computer attached to this keyboard, Wendy Carlo starts to build a xylophone. Here's the first pure tone. Now, obviously, if we want to make it that sound like a xylophone, we're going to have to make it speak more quickly. So I'll shorten the attack from being about a half a second. There. Now it's getting on almost instantaneously, but it's lasting too long. Let me drop that down a bit. Ah, this is much more like a xylophone. Well, that one sounds pretty good. So I'll take that pattern and play a simple music phrase. Now she specifies three more pure tones in the proportion she already knows that a real xylophone produces. Now I'll put in all four of them. Now this is something that's very close to being a replica of a xylophone, but there's an element that's missing, and that is the hammer noise that you get with a real instrument when the mallet impacts against the wood. So finally, she adds a brief electronic shake to all the components. This is the anechoic chamber at Bell Labs. Here, 10 years ago, when it became clear that computers were going to be able to do things like imitate xylophones, a critical experiment was done. We have the microphone in this direction, so you can play in that direction mm -hmm. whenever you want, as soon as I close the door. Okay. Jean-Claude Risse was analyzing the pure tone components in a trumpet sound and was to make a critical discovery. Risse was working with Max Matthews, who at the time was writing the first computer program for sound synthesis. Increased the bandwidth. On the screen, the spikes represent the many pure tone components in the trumpet sound. Risse noticed something about how they behave. When it gets louder, more brilliant, there is more high frequency energy coming in. The higher components, the ones on the right, only appear when the note gets louder. As a result, the sound quality changes, gets brighter. With this simple idea, for the first time, their computer could produce a sound which came close to that of a trumpet. Here it is. To get a very realistic imitation, you do have to take care of many details, but this is the basic recipe and one which is used in present-day synthesizers. The voices you are now hearing are completely synthetic. They were created here in Paris at IRCAN, part of the Pompidou Art Center. Scientists now know a large number of those details needed for realistic synthesis, like the hammer blow of Wendy Carlos' xylophone. Synthesis of the human voice, done here by Xavier Rodet, is a perfect example. We'll pick it up where he starts to add the details. First, the basic combination of pure tones. Let's hear it. Now, 
called the first detail. In singing, it's very uh, usual to add vibrato. <laughs> A singer would certainly do crescendos and decrescendos. What we heard was a kind of uh, volume control change on the steady state tone. So it doesn't sound so natural. In fact, when a singer would, would do a crescendo, it would change the uh, richness of the sound in high frequency. It's the same as the trumpet a common effect. Uh, then we have to consider the way a singer would go from one note to the other. Now, of course, we want to go from the note to the other in a much more natural way, which is something like a, a smooth transition uh, from the low pitch to the high pitch. And so we started from the simple tone. We added vibrato, we added crescendo and the modification of the richness of the sound with volume and uh, also we set up the transition between notes and finally we could uh, really make the computer sing uh, a melody. In this piece, just the piano is real. The beautiful voice only exists somewhere inside this computer. There really is no sound which the computer cannot now reproduce. of the violin, entirely real in this case. But the instrument is far from conventional. It's the product of a sophisticated investigation into wood and varnish, which aims to reproduce the materials used in the golden age of Italian violin making, when in the 17th and 18th centuries, the famous Strads and Guarneri's were made. Violinist Zena Schiff's instrument owes its sound first to a piece of spruce wood, but treated in a particular way, like the darker sample on the left. It's crucially different from the lighter piece which was seasoned by air drying, as Joseph Najavari, chemistry professor at Texas A&M, explains. If I drop this wood in a tank of water, as you expect, since it has a low density, it will float there, and it will float there for years. The air is trapped inside. Now, in contrast, this is a sample of Italian spruce, which I have uh, procured personally when it was green. When the tree is green, it is full of saps and liquid, and there's very little air in it. So for that reason, when I place this wood now in water, since it has high density, this green wood will sink. If kept wet, the green wood is very slowly decomposed by naturally occurring microorganisms. Suspecting that the old violins were made from wood like this, Najavari begs some shavings from a restorer of fine instruments. When examined in the electron microscope, the shavings, these are from a famous Stradivarius, revealed a characteristic pattern. Magnified about 2,000 times, the wood structure is seen to be filled with open holes. The so-called pit hole membranes are missing. The same open pit holes can be seen in Ajavari's own wet seasoned wood. But this dry seasoned wood, the kind that modern violins are made of, has solid closed off pit holes. 
Najavari believes that the old violin makers couldn't help using wet seasoned wood because it came from Venice, center of the wood trade, where the merchants kept their logs in the sea. The idea that Stradivari went to the mountain top with a hammer in the hand knocking on the trees is obviously very naive. It was much more efficient for him to do the selection in Venice, where, where there were thousands of logs available to him. Another old sample, but now it's the varnish that's under investigation. Under the microscope, Najavari made a startling discovery. Tiny mineral crystals from gemstones of various kinds. He set about making his own gemstone varnish, grinding up semi-precious crystals and then separating out the finest particles using this flotation process known to the old alchemists as levitation. It all made sense. Gemstones had magic properties to the alchemists who ran the chemistry trade. A fine varnish bought in Venice could easily contain gem powder. Najavari believes the stiff gemstone varnish complements his wood. The resulting strong but light structure responds quickly, produces great power, and the gemstones in the varnish filter out irritating high sound components. I believe it may be a sacrilege to suggest, but I honestly think that the old violin makers did not know anything more about violin making than the new violin, the modern violin maker. They have bought their wood in the supply houses, just like the modern maker, except their wood came from Venice, which was processed in the sea. They have purchased their varnish and varnish ingredients in the chemical supply house in the drugstore in Venice. And the varnish was made by the chemists there. They had no personal knowledge of either wood or varnish. They were just the lucky beneficiaries of the greatest historical coincidence. This is the, the violin that I played on this weekend. Just... Nova asked Zena Schiff to visit Ben Kudlock who used to look after the violins of the great Yasha yeah, Heifetz. Nice Zena herself was Heifetz's student. The varnish is very nice. I like a redder varnish, personally. This example uses the Najavari wood, but not the gemstone varnish. But the work is excellent. Good work. The typical Monari's Del Gesu copy. And I would say, yeah, this, these are ringing very good. The, the two top strings are yeah. dead. That's because the sound post inside is in the wrong place. That's they, what he said. Yeah, well, I'm glad spot. that he knows it, too. <laughs> Kudlock couldn't resist making the fine adjustments necessary for best performance. Next, a very recent model with both wood and gemstone varnish. And I don't know what, uh, what they put in this varnish, but I don't see any beautiful color in it. There's, not, there's no color in this at all. It's not colorful to look at. When you take one of the, any of the old masters, you see that gorgeous quality in the color, the beautiful uh, quality, and, and it's thick. This is a, a th it's like, well, it reminds me of the varnishing the bottom of a boat. The appearance was not well received, but the sound. Yeah, those overtones are deafening. This sounds much better than the other one to me. That's what he said, even though it's only two weeks old. It's, even uh, despite what some people say, that, that the older ones, but he said this one's going to be better. That's right. And then the real thing. Well, that's a beautiful violin. Well, that's the Joseph Phyllis Sandry Guarneris. 
Uh, made in uh, 1740, about, wasn't it? Yes. About 1740. Now look at this varnish. You see that rich gold, that golden brown color? All this is original. And where, from here, where it's worn off from playing, it's still protected. The wood is protected. Looks good and sounds beautiful. The old violin will always be Ben Kudlock's favorite, but we asked him how the sound of the Najavari violins compared to other modern instruments. I think they're better than most of them that I've heard. In fact, I haven't heard any that are better than this. I've heard quite a few of them, but I don't think they're better in quality than this. But this sound is better than most of the new ones I've heard, maybe better than all of them. Judging fine violins is, even in this computer age, a subjective business. We left the newest violin with Van Kudlock. He wanted to make some adjustments and fit a new bridge, and he went to a Zena Schiff concert. His conviction was strengthened. It was, he said, the best new violin I've heard. Perhaps Najavari's on to something, but he's a controversial figure, unpopular with dealers in fine old instruments who like to ridicule his ideas, but he doesn't seem to mind. I have had many thrills in my life. Surviving World War II was one of them, but this is clearly a highlight to hear a brilliant player in one of the great concertos of all times played on my violin. the best attitude is Zena Schiff's. Beauty, after all, is in the ear of the beholder. How do you measure this? It's very difficult. To me, it's what I hear in my ear and with the audience. If, if they think it sounds great, am I going to argue with them? As Zena Schiff understands, the relationship between performer and audience is a vital one. That's why the electronic violin and this strange drum were invented. Electronic music can be so cold and inhuman, but here the human beings are in charge. Right here on the stage, the performers are manipulating a synthesizer and the computer which runs it. Playing the drum is composer Richard Boulanger. It's a composer's dream. It's absolutely a blast to play. It's very responsive. Um, it allows me to be uh, in control of the expression of my musical ideas. Max Matthews invented the drum. For him, the baton, as he calls it, opens up music making to people who cannot play an instrument. The computer already knows the score. The baton lets him conduct the orchestra however he wants. The loudness of the winds is controlled by this axis so that this will be uh, loud for the winds and this will be soft. And the loudness of the strings is controlled by this axis so the strings are loud here and soft here. I'll illustrate that by playing a little example from the beginning of the aria. And it starts with the uh, woodwinds loud. Now I'll play 
that again, softer. Now we'll bring them up. Now we bring out the strings. And now the winds. So you see, I have very uh, complete control over the voices of the orchestra. And of course, there's a soprano that sings with this. And I can follow her singing uh, very closely. And I can balance my sound to how loud she wants the music. The beauty of the baton is its flexibility. Different instruments or a new piece of music are just a matter of reprogramming the computer. And that essential quality of live performance is never lost. Control, it turns the computer back into or into at last a musical instrument and that's very exciting Boston's Handel and Haydn Society is playing the Overture to Messiah. The instruments are all antiques or close copies, matching precisely the 18th century music being played. But whether playing computers or cellos, performers bring a vital added dimension, their style of playing. Christopher Hogwood, an expert on musical style, explains. Even if you opt to use original instruments, this doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a stylish performance. You could take the first few measures of the Overture to Messiah and treat them literally as they appear to be written on the page. You would get this effect. So a large part of what music consists of is musical style. But what's musical is an elusive thing. Concert pianist Malcolm Bilson is playing Mozart. He is, of course, adding to his performance the elements of musical style that he judges appropriate. I'd like to ask you to play unmusically, and by that I mean don't do whatever you consider to be At Cornell, psychologist Caroline Palmer persuades musicians to remove all musical elements from their playing. That way, she hopes to find out just what those elements consist of. Here, Bilson tries to play Mozart unmusically. She looks at different historical periods. That was classical Mozart. This is romantic Brahms. First, he plays it musically. Now, Bilson tries the same piece unmusically, but it's not easy.
Did you feel that was your most unmusical performance? Probably not. You know, it, it's it, it's still like a poem, after all this thing. It is a lullaby. It's like a poem, and I just can't help hearing lines. And sometimes I reflected that a little bit. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, can I make you try it again? <laughs> yeah, I could probably do it somewhat more. worse. CD or only cassette? <laughs> Caroline Palmer has found some basic recurring patterns. First, melody is often brought out by playing it out of sync, exaggerated in this demonstration. Musical playing is choppy, like this, called staccato. Musical is more often legato or smooth, like this. Each note lasts for a longer time. Finally, there's rubato, small expressive changes of pace. These patterns were found in these two different styles, the classical style and the romantic style, as well as being consistent across performers and within a performer across performances. Uh, indicating that there's some degree of generality to these rules. Now, there's probably many other rules characterizing musical performance, and some of which may be very specific to the interpretation as well as the instrument being played and the style of the period. But I think timing is uh, an important dimension for all instruments. It's one of the dimensions on which performers can manipulate information to communicate their interpretation to listeners. If manipulating timing is an essential part of what musicians do, the strange thing is that how much they do it is always changing, to such an extent that each era virtually redefines what music is. Christopher Hogwood. The amalgam of different attitudes to how you should interpret this phrase or that phrase will vary according to the flavor of the week. One listens to uh, a performance of a well-known uh, violin solo, for instance, recorded in 1920 or 1930. You see lots of incredible mannerisms, the way the uh, violinist shifts and slides, the amount of vibrato, the type of rubato and flexing of the tempo, which na we nowadays would, would call real tea shop music. It really is lush, over-romantic, we say, slushy, old-fashioned. Uh, it it uh, acquires a whole battery of unflattering adjectives. At the time, this was considered the height of stylishness. This is how you should play the music. So science understands a little about musical performance and quite a lot about the nature of musical sound. But we know virtually nothing about how music affects our minds. Yet millions in the Nova audience will find this music stirring or exciting or fascinating, evocative in some way or another.
So how does the brain process music? Put the headphones on with the red headphone to the right ear and the blue headphone to the left. This okay. perception experiment is one of several conducted in this University of California lab by Diana Deutsch. One ear gets the following. And at the same time, the other ear gets but the subjects never perceive those patterns. Well, I hear, um, I hear two melodic patterns in contrary motion, and they begin an octave apart, and then the one on the right ear is higher, and it descends in the nascent. Just over and over and over again. And then there's one on the left ear, which is low, and begins an octave below that. What is going on in the brain? This is the input to one ear, and this to the other. Together, the brain constructs two new melodies. We'll separate one out. It's made up from notes that are as close in pitch as possible. Diana Deutsch believes that's what we are used to hearing with natural sounds. Similar sounds are likely to be coming from one source and different sounds from different sources. So with this type of pattern, it makes sense for the listener to assume that those in one frequency range are coming from one source and tones in another frequency range from a different source. We therefore perceptually reorganize the tones in accordance with this interpretation. We are reorganizing this orchestra so we can hear a remarkable example of this effect. The musicians who play the second violin part are moving to their 19th century position on the right. The passage will be from Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, written when orchestras were arranged this way. With the second violins now on the right, the first violin section remains on the left. This is the first violin part. It's intended to go with this second violin part. Now, together, something new emerges. Just as in the lab experiment, our brains hear a melody that no instrument is playing. Now here's the piece in its full musical context. It's a perfect example of the complexities that appear when you try to analyze how music and mind interact. This is Sydney, Australia. The opera house juts out into the harbor, and nearby is the music conservatorium. It houses perhaps the only scientist in the world who's worked on emotion in music. Manfred Kleins is a neuroscientist by training, but a musician by inclination. He's worked for many years on gesture. In fact, he's recorded these simple pressure signals generated while imagining music 
for some of the world's greatest musicians. It occurred to Kleins that these gestures might represent that essential but hidden part of music, its emotional message. So he started a bizarre series of experiments. Subjects were asked to use finger pressure to express different emotions. Grief. For many subjects, the gesture and the emotion apparently reinforced each other. Soon, a set of gestures, similar for many subjects, emerged. Klein's move to the next step. This is number one. New subjects were taught a series of seven different gestures. Do it together with me. Between them is a screen which cuts off any possible facial communication. This represents joy, although as yet, the subject does not know any such interpretation. This is grief. We'll superimpose how the pressure on the button changes so the shape becomes clear. And this signifies anger. Okay. Could you look at this? And uh, tell us what, you, what your choice is. Okay, uh, one is joy. Once the subject has memorized all seven gestures, he's asked to match them up. It's the first time he's seen the list. Seven was grief. Several hundred subjects in Australia and America had no difficulty matching gestures to the emotions which had first generated them. Kleins concluded it was a kind of emotional language. And then he had another idea. He could convert the gestures into sounds. The harder the push, the higher and louder the sound. As you express the particular quality, that same shape became the shape of the sound in terms of pitch and in terms of amp amplitude of loudness. And the first one of these represents anger. That has an abruptness to it, just like the actual anger expression. It's a territorial defense. This is grief. And this joy. It's like saying, wow. With this new tool, he sped off into the Australian outback. The sound shapes communicated emotions to his white subjects as effectively as the visual forms. But what about people of a different culture? Are the shapes more universal? Working through an interpreter, Kleins tested Aborigine subjects using the sound shapes. The order in which he will hear it is not the order in which these are written here. Mm -hmm. Tell them that they hear yeah. any one first. It doesn't matter which. I order only the matter. I'm with ten and jump. Good. He's careful not to give away any hints. He found essentially no difference between Aborigine and Western subjects in ability to identify the shapes. Yarty. 
So Kleins believes these forms are a universal emotional language and are to be found everywhere in music. Music is par excellence a language of emotions. For example, the funeral march of Beethoven's Eroica, where it expresses grief along the lines of, of these shapes that you read. Desolation, despair. And uh, in the Haydn, there's exuberance, joy. You get all different types of emotion. Each one, the more precisely you perform it, the more precisely it conforms to the biologic form, the more convincing, the more eloquent, the more contagious it is to convince others, to change the state of feeling in the other person. So music is emotions, it's complex sounds, it's musicians adjusting their performances, and much more. We asked our participants what they think music is. Music lets you become free, free of your own personal life. In Paris, what is music? A structure in, in time and sounds that uh, tells us something, that moves us somewhere. In Greenwich Village, what is music? I like Perez's definition. He said it was organized sound. That's so broad that it, um, it embraces anything in the future that you can't predict, you know? For the violin maker, what is music? Music, to me, is pleasing sounds. The beauty of the sound, to me, primarily, is music. To the violinist, what is music? It's my whole life. At the Handel and Haydn Society, what is music? Music is the use of sounds to move the human soul. For the concert pianist, what is music? I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what the, why it's good or anything, but it seems awfully important. And for the scientist? What is music? That is a difficult question to answer.